Meat is indisputably the most American food group. Every joke about American food relies on a heart attack inducing amount of red meat, grilled to a perfect medium rare. And for the most part, it's correct. Every state has their own disgustingly delicious meat dish. But for many Americans, although meat is on their mind, where that meat comes from. Welcome to Spoonable Standpoint, the podcast where your hosts, Leo and Charlene, dig into food culture. In this episode, we'll discuss the history of the meat industry as well as how hidden it seems to be from Americans. Why is the meat industry like how it currently is? How does it differ from other meat industries internationally? But first, how did it come to be? For many cultures, meat is a central part of their diet. From steaks to livers, humans eat everything, and they cook it well too. But how come meat is such a core part of humanity? The answer, like many, can be answered by turning back the Earth's clock all the way back to the end of an ice age. About 2.5 to 2.6 million years ago, the Earth began to warm, so the barren chills became dry heat, leading to the deaths of many plant species. Many of those plants were plants that produced fruits, like the ones our ancestors needed to survive on. With those gone, all that was left were grasses, which we were not able to digest properly. But although some food was scarce, many herbivores still thrived on the grasses. Our ancestors, always looking for a meal, turned to those herbivores for their next one. At that point, humans were terrible at hunting, since, like other animals, they didn't evolve to be carnivores, which meant they had to scavenge. The issue was that they did not have first dibs on many carcasses, so by the time hyenas and other animals got to them, all we were left with were the bones. But, over time, humans became increasingly better at making tools to assist them, since they lacked the proper natural facilities to do so. So, at one point, we became the hunters, not the scavengers. Around that time, humans created the next innovation in meat consumption, cooked food. By heating up food, it became easier to digest and led to much better health since many bacteria were killed off in the cooking process. In addition, it cut the eating time in half, leaving humans more time and energy to do other things. But the meat industry back then was simple. Find meat, eat meat. Over time, as animals became domesticated, the industry changed. But in modern America, it is completely different than any of that. How did it get to this point? One of the most historical meats is sausage. But although U.S. history focuses on its production during the Industrial Revolution, sausage is an incredibly strange meat people likely do not know what is in sausage. No matter what, it is known that sausages do not contain the parts of animals we typically eat in America. But this grinding of alternative parts of the animal has been the whole reason for sausages. They were first used 5,000 years ago by the Sumerians, and what is known is that they were initially created in order to preserve blood, offal, and scrap meat. All of these parts of an animal are not necessarily portable since I don't think many wanted to carry around loose pig blood in their bags. Being able to put them in animal intestines made all of those parts much more portable and easier to cook. So in a word, convenient. Over time, it morphed into different types in many cultures. Some as familiar to Americans as sausage links, to others not as familiar, like haggis. For all of this history, There were no freezers. How did anyone get meat from far away? The meatpacking industry in America before 1870 was very different from what it is now. Some may not even call it an industry. If you wanted meat, you would go to a local butcher who probably killed the animal themselves or knew exactly how to do it. This meant that the meat was local as well as limited. If there wasn't a cattle farm nearby, you might not have been able to get any beef. 
That all changed, though, when, in 1869, the Transcontinental Railroad was completed. The Transcontinental Railroad was a railroad system that connected the West Coast with the East Coast, truly unifying the country from sea to shining sea. Most importantly, the railroad was able to connect farms to factories. Along with the invention of freezers, meat from across the country could be transported, packed, and distributed to anyone, anywhere in the country. This completely changed the industry, perhaps even creating it. As time went on, and better business practices were put into place like the creation of the FDA, the industry continued to grow into what it is now. But what is the industry like now? And how did it transform? If you take a U.S. history course, one of the time periods that you talk about is the late 1800s, early 1900s, when you talk about uh, muckrakers, I guess journalists who uh, dug up information about tenements and some industries to uncover some things that not many people (laughs) knew about if they weren't experiencing it. Things that did uh, change how the industry operates because, you know, backlash and all that stuff. One of these muckrakers wrote a book called The Jungle. Uh, <laughs> I have read part of The Jungle. It is a disgusting book. It's about the meat industry. And this was before the the FDA and all that great stuff that makes sure that gross stuff isn't in our food. But um, this book has some truly disgusting things in it. One of them, one of the things they talk about is how sausages were made in this one factory. If anyone's listening and you do not like gross details, I am very sorry. (laughs) But essentially, these sausages were made where you had this vat of meat that was like marinating or mixing with other stuff. And they would kind of like, after the workday was done, they would kind of leave it open. They wouldn't close it or anything, they would just leave it. And that meant that during the night, um, rats and insects and stuff would, you know, come in looking for food. Um, sometimes they'll, you know, drown in all, like, the gross meat muck. Um, or if the machines were on, they would get, you know, squashed into the machines. Or even their fecal matter, um, finding their way into the food. But they would still package that meat. (laughs) Still turn that sausage meat into sausage. Uh, so a lot of people at the time were eating parts of rats, that kind of stuff. It's pretty disgusting. But it's interesting because the meat industry now is so heavily regulated, yet <laughs> there's so much bad stuff still happening in, uh, in the meat industry. Yeah, definitely. There's so much more regulation compared to how, it, yeah, like, as you said, it's, their animals are being raised in absolutely horrible conditions. Literally, like, if you go do a quick Google search on, like, oh, how chicken is raised, how cows are raised, you will not, you will probably, probably not want to eat those animals again, or eat them <laughs> less. I don't know, I don't know if it's just me, yeah. but I don't, as a person who doesn't really eat much to begin, eat much meat to be, begin with, now I'm like, ooh, I don't know. Like, I actually tried going vegan a few years ago, and this was part of the reason, because, like, they are being treated so, so, so cruelly. Especially chickens, like... Not even that. It's, like, it's way worse for chickens, like... Exactly. There's, like, thousands of chickens inside this, like, like small, long shack with no windows, and there's, like, a large fan, and... Just, like, it's... Like, as someone who does eat meat, like, for, like, almost every single meal like it's just like i don't even know how i deal with it like knowing this kind of stuff while eating (laughs) meat because to be quite honest like i don't know maybe i have like no empathy or something but it's very messed up i think part of the reason why you and a lot of other people wouldn't like it wouldn't change their eating habits much is because especially in america and and other similarly industrialized countries you never really get to see firsthand you never get to see your dinner firsthand you never get to see how it's processed and everything firsthand once you see that once you really like once it really gets to you personally how it was a living animal and then it's being slaughtered like that just hits different like I remember very clearly one time in China, I went to a really rural part, and there was this restaurant, 
And they would raise chickens more humanely because they were, for the most part, they had the space and they had, like, the abilities to be kept out in the open for at least a little and not crammed into these tight cages, right? It was in rural China, so they had the space, and it was a restaurant. We were just all eating, you know, and all of a sudden, downstairs, we hear them starting to slaughter the chickens, and then they're just, obviously, the chickens are, like, making, like, huge noises, and people at the dinner table who were from America which is, like, basically two people, me being one of them, <laughs> were kind of freaked out. We were like, whoa, okay. You know, this is, uh, this is a little, like, hearing exactly what... a little what, messed up. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> hearing what goes on to get your food is a little a bit like, whoa. But everyone else in China who has already lived and grew up in rural China and already had this... Ex- yeah, experienced it. Yeah, had this experience, they were, they were in phase. They were just like, all right. They were just like, all right, this is normal. And I remember another time when I went to, again, rural China, they were slaughtering, like, a baby sheep or something, like, right on the street. And then my mom goes up to go, and she's like, that's messed up, right? And then they were like, oh, but how is that messed up? We're literally <laughs> only showing you guys. We're, we have to show our customers how fresh the meat is. It, just, it really goes to show, like, a lot of our perception of it just really just depends on how we grew up because in america i bet if any like if most other americans went through those same experiences they wouldn't they would want to eat meat at least a little less we're just not used to it so there's that difference as well i watched this uh the cnn um original series with uh stanley tucci where he goes to italy and like tries food and stuff there was just one place he went to where they literally had like this pen outside this rabbit hole and then a rabbit would come out and they would, like, kill it. Um, <laughs> which is, like, I feel like when it comes to that kind of stuff, like, seeing a chicken die is, like, chickens aren't, I don't know. Do you find chickens that cute? Because I don't really find them that cute. But it's, like, these small little bunnies being killed. Oh, that really sends you. You're, like, oh, crap. But, yeah, I I think you're, I, I think it's totally right. The moment you know, like, exactly where coming from and like you see it get killed i feel like um you start to have a distaste towards meat but i think at the same time it could also like make you want to have it more in some cases i don't hunt but i know some people they enjoy hunting because they like the satisfaction of like eating meat that they catch which i guess is some like human (laughs) instinctual drive (laughs) um yeah, exactly. Some it's it's messed up. But <laughs> I think it just speaks to I think how we have the meat processing uh system in place and meat packing system in place. It really goes to show how different America is than the rest of the world because I bet in the rest of the world you have this connection to your meat where you know, even if you didn't kill the pig or something, you might know the people who did. Um, right, and you might have seen that pig die. You might, you might have even said, "I want that pig," you know, before it was even killed. Exactly. Um, and I think that really connects you differently with the food. And I feel like in America, that's something we're missing. Now, am I saying, <laughs> am I saying, you know, the back of the Stop and Shop there should be like two thousand chickens where we're just like, all right, wh- which one are we eating tonight, guys? No, absolutely not. But I feel like the meat industry kind of needs to be altered in some way where there can be like a... You have an experience connecting with um, like the food you're going to eat. But what do you think? Do you think that's feasible or do you think that's absolutely like out of the question? Uh, right now, like, after what you're just saying, I'm picturing, like, yeah. hey, guys, we're going on a school trip to a <laughs> meat farm. And, like, traumatize so, uh, a bunch of second graders. All right, everyone, uh, raise your hand if you eat meat. Timmy, you eat meat? Hoo-hoo. You will not soon. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. Right. No, I'm that's not, not really what I, like, I'm not, that's not really what I'm saying, but I'm, like, <laughs> there's, like, more education about it, maybe, or, um... They're, like, more, like, small vendors. Like, like that kind of stuff, I mean. Like, even education, I don't think would be enough to, you know, show it. Because, like, it could just be me. 
again. But I'm looking through all this, and I'm, like, kind of, like, hesitant to eat more meat now. But that does not even begin to compare to the reaction I had when I was experiencing all this stuff firsthand. It's a whole yeah. different experience. Now, no one can say that it's feasible to show firsthand every meat-loving or even just uh, any average American that eats meat to show all of them what really goes on behind in the industry. Mm-hmm. That just wouldn't be feasible, right? But I do think yeah, there should be more transparency. And I think by demanding more transparency or even creating like a public shift towards transparency, because companies will have no choice but either you know, show, ex- show exactly how they're treating them or get better so that what they do show is better. So I don't know. That's, that's kind yeah. of what I think it has to go. Yeah, I, I I totally agree. Plus, like, I feel like it's not in these companies' best interests mm-hmm. to actually show you. Like, mm-hmm. I'm sure if you saw what happens at Purdue Farms, you would not ever want to <laughs> even see a chicken again. Exactly. Um, and I, I think another thing that sets American meat industry apart from the rest of the world is that in America, we breed chickens and every other kind of animal that becomes meat we breed them in certain ways where we get what we want out of them. Exactly. Or like in other parts of the world, they're like, all right, we, ha- we killed the chicken. Uh, th- we did not feed the chicken enough. Our bad. We didn't really have the money, but whatever. Uh, let's eat the chicken leg. Um, in America, you do not see uh, chicken legs usually in like mainstream supermarkets. For the most part, I would say you do not. Um, mm-hmm. I, I know that chickens are, um, raised to have larger breast areas because the chicken breast is what most Americans want. Cause it's like quote unquote healthier. So like, at, like those chickens inside of those long shacks, the large turbine, some of them don't even like, are they are not able to stand because they were not bred to have strong leg muscles. They live their entire life, which is. Shorter, by the way. Oh, they're bred to um to grow faster. All of these things makes like how they raise chickens just absolutely insane and terrible. But again, in other parts of the world, they don't really do that. They're just kind of like whatever we have, we have. Um, how do you think that speaks to American culture? How does that relate to American culture? I mean, it just really goes to show like how far companies will go to you know, have the most output, uh, make the most money, like, with the smallest possible amount of space and money. Now, of Mm -hmm. course, raising, feeding, killing chickens uses so much energy, food, water, resources, Yeah. and has a huge environmental impact, which we will cover in in, in another part of this episode, actually. It just really goes to show, like, Companies don't really care. And if as long as the people aren't too aware, if they aren't, you know, doing the research, if they aren't, if they, or, or if they're just, you know, too much of a meat lover, I guess, which, I mean, there's no yeah. problem with that, but, you know, there's there, there's still an issue there with how it's being produced, right? It just doesn't sit too right with me, but... I mean, yeah. I mean, I find it kind of messed up that, um, like, all of these meat companies are like capitalist companies because Mm -hmm. like think about it so these are some statistics 3.6 million cattle 587,000 calves 129.9 million hogs or pigs 2.23 million sheep and lambs that amount that many animals becomes 55 billion pounds of whatever meat they turn into so 55 billion pounds per year is how much meat is being packed in in America which is an insane amount of meat if you're packing that much like stuff that used to be alive i feel like there should be different government regulation than there is now like we have like okay health standards but i feel like there should be some sort of cruelty standard because i don't know when <laughs> We've, you know, you, you see it even with like human lives and companies. Like companies do not care exactly. what they do as long as they make money. So I think it would be beneficial if there was like some sort of like cruelty certificate or like 
not a cruelty certification. <laughs> like, like this this chicken was abused. Uh, to be like these companies have been approved by the FDA as they you know are non cruel razors or, or or whatever. I know there's like cruelty free, which is like total BS and like it's not based on anything. Um, but I feel like there should be some sort of like official verification because I don't know that statistic just makes my stomach drop. Exactly, exactly. And yeah, as you said, a lot of the food labels that we see are completely like they don't mean much. Like for like as we keep talking about chickens, like cage free, free range. That doesn't necessarily mean anything. Cage free literally means like to my understanding, it literally just means they're allowed to roam around. Doesn't mean they get to go outside. They just don't stay in a cage, basically. Their conditions could be just as bad, just just they happen to not be in a cage and they can get a little bit more room to roam around. Free range, however, you, you know, on the on the packaging of the chicken, uh, of the eggs, you're, you're going to see, oh, you're going to see, like, you're going to see happy farming families, you know, <laughs> carrying chickens, smiling kids in open, huge grass fields. No. Like, all free range really means is that they get some outdoors time. It doesn't have to be every day. Yeah. It doesn't have to be all day, you know? It doesn't It doesn't mean much, and they're using And that. what does outdoor mean? What does outdoor mean? Exactly. It can literally it can, just be, like, a stable or something. Exactly. It can be that, only fit a few chickens at a time. It, it, it's literally all that. So, the fact that companies are also using this to, you know, try to advertise their humaneness, I, that that's just more even more cruel on their part. Yeah. Uh, just so you know, if you want to hear more about labels, perhaps, uh, we are going to do a future episode on organic food and their labels, and we'll talk a little bit, we'll talk more about, uh, these labels in the coming episode, but, yeah, I, I completely agree with you. I mean, <laughs> it's, you shouldn't be able to put, like, whatever you want on, um, on labels, and, um, so, in a previous episode, uh, Last season, we talked about plant-based food. We talked about, you know, possible burger, that kind of stuff. Now we're talking about the meat industry. Do you think, kind of as a way to end off, do you think that the meat industry could be replaced by the plant food, plant-based food industry? industry? In America, I don't think so. But I do think its um, effects can be kind of, can be decreased. Its negative effects can be decreased, but I do not think yeah. it can be... A, a whole replacement you know not even after... replace but like do you think you could like take like a large like chunk out of the meat industry i don't even know about a large chunk like i haven't done too much research into that aspect and like them combining the two together but i do know that it can reduce the severity of the problem especially on the environmental side i'm not entirely with the cruelty side because a lot of um lab grown meats to not just plant-based meats lab grown meats that do cl more closely mimic, like, actual meat, actual animal products, they mm -hmm. still require, like, stem cells and things from the animals. So it's not 100% yeah. like, <laughs> humane. Like, they, a lot of the times, they use fetal bovine serum, which is basically the blood of a fetal cow. Yeah. So it's, like, I don't know. It's not completely humane, but definitely a lot better than having a cow's entire life raised in, like, miserable situations so yeah. it's a step it's a step away from what we are now are at now but i do think that meat is such a huge part of american culture i don't think it can make like a huge huge impact on like the future of meat really but to mitigate the negative effects that the meat industry has on now i do think it can have some sort of benefit Thank you for tuning into this week's episode of Spoonful Standpoint. If there's something you want us to talk about, put it in the question we pose on Spotify under our Season 2 trailer or on our website. This episode idea was submitted by Spotify user P. Moore. Make sure to follow us on Instagram at Spoonful underscore Standpoint for bonus content and a link to our website. If you like this episode, don't forget to share it. We release a new episode every other Friday, and we hope to see you there.